Thank you, Chair Lady, and thank you for bringing this to the forefront. I'm still not exactly sure what, what this is all about or what y'all do, but I'm, I'm learning. So as I said up here, you're, you got a bunch of old guys that uh, still are in powder blue leisure suits with Zingo Dingo zip-up boots and are still listening to eight tracks in their 72 AMC Gremlin fastback. So I mean, that, that's who you're calling on to regulate this, and I'm kind of afraid of the regulation because we could end up stifling something that, that could be really good for this country and this world. Um, but uh, Can I say to my friend, I think you're speaking for yourself. I don't, the only thing I even knew what you just said was 8-track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I loaned him my Johnny Paycheck 8-track, and it's, it's the Christmas special. I'll be needing to get that back here pretty soon. Thank you, sir, as always. Uh, Dr. Ho, uh, do you know of any instances of foreign countries like China who are using artificial intelligence to oppress its citizens? Uh, there are indeed uh, foreign adversaries who have used AI to uh, uh, repress uh, uh, populations. And uh, to step back here a little bit, uh, all of this is happening in the context of this kind of uh, geopolitical competition where uh, China, for instance, has announced that it wants to be the world's leader in AI by 2030. Just to go back to your opening remarks, though, uh, I think you're uh, right to uh, sort of express the concern about overregulating, and that's why in my opening remarks the thing I'm quite uh, uh, sort of fond of is a kind of adverse event reporting system where for cybersecurity harms, uh, harms of medical devices, uh, there are ways to drive down the information gap of what is known in the private sector and between government so that we can have forms of regulation that aren't overbearing and that are, are actually tailored to the kinds of harms that have manifested. Let me ask you, don't punch your button yet, Dr. Howe. Um, does China use this to, um, to advance its agenda abroad? And if so, how? Uh, yes, as we've uh, seen in other instances uh, with uh, you know hardware like the ones from uh, uh, the, involving the company Huawei, there are real concerns uh, about our foreign adversaries using technology as a way to influence uh, countries. That's why I think international collaboration around these issues is going to be central. Uh, it is uh, really good to see that in the EO we are seeing you know an entire section dedicated to really fostering uh, multilateral collaboration amongst like-minded countries so that we can have a form of tech diplomacy so that the value Values that are encoded in these kinds of systems are uh, ones that are really uh, uh, representing the kind of uh, American values uh, that exist uh, uh, here. Uh, for instance, you have uh, related to some of the earlier discussion of the NIST AI RMF, the executive order uh, uh, requires a development playbook of how to actually adapt uh, the RMF framework to work uh, with other uh, uh, countries. And there are also proposals like the Multilateral AI Research Institute to try to bring like-minded countries together. That was a recommendation endorsed by the National AI Advisory Committee on which I sit uh, to actually bring like-minded countries together to formulate a, a, a collaborative approach to AI governance. What about Executive Order 14110? Do you think it goes far enough to allow us to compete against China? Uh, I think the executive order, as I said in my opening remarks, is, in a, real, is a really important first step. Uh, it is the first step and I think there are uh, numerous other steps uh, that I think Cong I'm hoping Congress uh, will take, uh, particularly uh, to invest in uh, leadership within government, to bring talent both uh, to the government, to have a pipeline of, of uh, folks within agencies, but also to train, retain, and uh, uh, attract talent here uh, to the United States. Maybe one fact I can give is that 40% of engineering and science PhDs in the country are visa holders. And historically, we as a country have been remarkable at retaining that talent. One estimate has it that 80 to 90% of those PhDs stay in the country. Recently, there have been signs that that has been changing. And we do not, at this point, want a kind of brain drain where people are leaving the country. And I think the EO's provisions that are particularly uh, speaking to the immigration front on that uh, side, I think, are quite important. We as a country have to remain a magnet for scientific talent for us to retain the kind of leadership position that we currently enjoy. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just to your question about China and the, um, the way they use AI, uh, 
a few months ago, my, my former colleague Jeffrey Kane testified in the Senate about uh, his book, The Perfect Police State, which discusses China's use of AI to monitor the Uyghur population as a pilot program for their country as a whole. And I think uh, as AI disrupts institutions worldwide, there's going to be a race among every tin pot dictator out there to import technology to restore security. And one of the roles the U.S. can play is by developing defensive technology that can do things like policing and law enforcement while preserving civil liberties. All right. I've run over my time. Ranking you're, member. You're welcome. Chair Lady.